Big shit, big shit, big shit. It's a unique hustle, nigga. Big shit, big shit, big shit, big shit. Name another podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECEO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. Wait. <laughs> That's what my girl EXO did it, man. What's not going not, on? Nothing, not Madame. Man, hey, man. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we back in this thing, man. How they say it back in there, like swimwear or something like that, man. It's going down, man. Hey, man, Boss Talk 101 is a thing. Make sure you guys like and subscribe to the channel. Um, yeah, we, we pulling up. And we in here, and we looking around, and we trying to figure out what's going down. Holla at your boy. It's a unique hustle, man. I got my boy Big Lucci in the building today. What's going on, man? Man, do people ever be like, man, Mr. Lucci, where you get this name? Like, do people ever ask you about that? Yeah, the, that's kind of the funny part because uh, my real nickname is Mr. Are you so, serious? Yeah, uh, my, my birth nickname is Mr. That's so, crazy, man. You must have looked like an old man when you was a baby. <laughs> uh, my mama said I was bossy. So my whole mm. family said I was real bossy. So they named me Mr. So, yeah. Like, basically, a uh, old friend of my brother's, she basically, you know, when she heard the name Mr., she tripped out. So she used to call me Mr. Lucci. And I used to hate that. And I used to tell her, like, stop calling me that. I was still a kid then. But, man, she started calling me that so much. Everybody in my town picked up on it. And basically, they just dropped the Mr. after a while. I was like, oh, yeah. He on his money anyway, so just call him Lucci. So that's how I got that name. I just ran with it from like probably middle school, sixth, seventh grade. Wow, sixth, seventh grade. So growing up, you 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 from East Texas? I'm from East. Shout Texas. out to East Texas, man. We in the building. I already yeah, told y'all how I do, man. So <laughs> y'all already know what it is. I get louder, man. And, and he Eric, no, that boy from East Texas, man. What part? You down in Tyler? Longview. Longview. Um, actually, my store is in Tyler, but I'm from. Longview, you from three hundred? No, no, no where you no, from, man? I'm um, from Johnson Street. Longview. Johnson Street. I, I originally uh from the South Side of Longview. I grew up in Village South, and uh you know I got family all over Longview. But uh as far as like as far as I can remember, you know, growing up I was in Village South, and uh I had cousins and and a lot of friends on Johnson Johnson Street growing up. With, you know, so as I was over there with my family and all of that, that's just where. I grew up and actually started, you know, doing everything as a child. You know, wow. So. Yeah. Um, so when you, uh, what's up? So um, your mom and dad was in the household when you were growing up? Yes. I have both of my parents. Blessed. Just It's crazy because um, <laughs> as far as, like, when I was growing up, it was totally different for me. I'm, mm -hmm. I was very spoiled. Uh, I watched my pops work like two jobs since I was a kid. And my mama, you know, in and out the beauty shop. So both they certified hustlers, you know. Uh, and they gave all you the, everything. Everything. Even though I, we was in the hood for the longest. And uh, I felt like, you know, it didn't feel like I was in the hood because I know nothing about the struggle. That Like, as I, what I was surrounded in, it, it didn't feel like that. You know, I got friends and everything would come eat at my house because they knew food would be there and everything. But I never, I never, you know, witnessed no missing meals, no clothes and stuff like that. Right in the hood, my folks provided everything I needed. Have your parents ever told you about their journey when they were kids growing up? Because sometimes when parents um, give their kids their all like that, usually because they didn't have it when they were growing up. So they made sure overcompensate their children to make sure that they don't have to go through what they did. Uh, basically, I found out a lot about my parents as I got older. You know, and uh, it was from other people, you know, because uh, people always tell me, like, the OGs and everything else. You know, you mention my dad's name, and they tell me, man, you come from a, a family of gold. You know, you, you got a great stock of family. Like, they great people, you know. And uh, sometimes they never realize I was kind of bad as I was a child. So sometimes they never even realize, like, where did you get this from, <laughs> you know. But um, Where did you get it from? I have no idea. A lot of people say I got it from my pops. You know, well, explain but, <laughs> to us what bad is. Uh, I was very bad. Just, you know, normal child things, getting into stuff with your friends, you know, running wild, running into it with the laws, everything, you know. So uh, by the time I graduated, I, you know, changed my whole life. I older had siblings? Ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I have an older brother. And was he like that? 
he was more of uh, the hustler type. So that's why I so got he, my drive so for see, money. Okay, that's so why he was got, on the street. Yes, yeah, that's why I got my drive for, you know, mm-hmm. for that. So Well, it's very easy to get caught up in the streets in, in the country because it's so it ain't a lot going it's on. It's not a lot. It's, so it's so not. basically you end up, you know, when, the only time you're going out is coming to Dallas or going to Shreveport. So, you know, you, and then you, you see in the news, Shreveport news is crazy. It's crazy. And then you hear about the stuff going on in Dallas. So, yeah. you know, and then, then hey, Longview ain't no ain't no chump either when it nah. comes down to it. So uh, when you look at uh, all the stuff that, you you know, you're facing in this inner city and, and, and the way that it's boring, it causes you a lot of time to, you know, an uh, idle mind is the devil's workshop. But how do you keep your you know children? But, but being a father now, just like you said, and uh, um, how do you keep your children from getting into mischief like that? Um, I know you said your mom, she was in and out of beauty shops. She, your dad was working two jobs, so they were always busy. They didn't have as much time for you. That's where I got my free time is when Pops was at work. That's when I got my free time, you know, getting off at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, that's that's kind of hard. Mama trying to catch up on sleep, you know, and we, we just kids, you know, we just So you outside. felt like if, so if looking back now, you felt like if um, they had more time, you wouldn't have been on the street like you, you were? I can't say that because they did a great job with me. You know, uh, I was raised right, but you know, when you when you get a certain age, you build your own characteristics and everything else. You go your journey, no matter what you was taught, because you at that stage where your mind really not developed. You just hard headed and you feel like you know everything. Uh, as as the older people will say, you start smelling yourself mm-hmm. around you know your teenage years. So, you know, uh, my parents ain't played that at all. You know, so <laughs> I knew exactly. What you was doing. Yeah, I knew exactly what I was doing. But being a parent now, what would you say to your son? You see him doing the same things that that you, you see what I mean? So that's what I'm, so that's the reason why I'm asking all these questions because you have parents who are watching this and I'm a parent myself and you you try to be like, okay, because I hear so many people come on this platform and say, whether it's because I had a single parent, um, being a mom usually, who it is, and my mom really can't, be a man to me to, to, to put me in my place so I do what I want to do yeah. or I had both parents in the house but the streets got the best of me you know so it's like how do we change the narrative because this is a never-ending cycle that keep on happening even today so as a parent who's struggling with their child right now and watching this how can I stop this from happening how can I stop my child from being a product of society being you know and I'm going to prison or doing different things that he shouldn't be doing Sometimes uh, sometimes I feel like we can help it, but at the same time, I still remember where my mind was at when I was a kid. And uh, no matter how hard sometimes parents try, like you, you gotta let them, you know, you gotta let Not them bump their head. head sometimes because that's, that's, how, that's how I learned. I had to bump my head. You know, the first time uh, I was, had to been in like high school, I got in serious trouble. And, what is you know, serious you trouble? Serious trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Okay. But, go uh, ahead. I, I called my parents and I'm like, "Hey, y'all, y'all gotta come get me." You know, I'm mm-hmm. still in school at this time. My dad like, "Hell no, nah, I ain't coming to get you." You know, and that's just that. But me being mama's baby, you know, mama. Why is always the mamas? You know, mama gonna do whatever they gotta do to protect their babies and. Daddy was the same way, but fathers protecting a different, mm-hmm. a different form. You know, a father is more on that level to, you fuck up, you finna learn on your own. And, it depends. And that's just what that was. Because I'm, I'm a mama, but at the same time, I'm that person too. Like, you know, you yes, put ma'am. yourself in that situation, so guess what? You're going to have to live with out. the consequences. And you, have, you have some tough mothers like that. You know, uh, I feel like my mother was more on the level of, she had that, that support, not saying that you didn't, but right. my mother was more on that level where she had that support from a man. So it was like, she felt like, okay, I'll be the one baby y'all because I see y'all father, he hard. he stumped down, he hard on y'all. Like when when pops come around, you you know, there is no back talk. Uh, mama might have to ask you to do something three or four times before you get it done. but. When daddy say something, you better get up and do it right then. There is no yelling, no nothing. If I say do something, that mean do it. So I feel like that was a, a part of a part of that level, you know, where daddy had the authority and mama, 
she babied us, so we felt like we could get over on mama a little bit. Mm -hmm. He said, boy, Big Lucci, he talking that talk. He say, yeah, 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 he talking about family and goals. And, and, and that's goals most, and, most family. Yeah, most, family most families. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to ask you about the entrepreneurship because I know that you was raised in it now. You already didn't show me that through your mm -hmm. parents. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you in a way to say where did you get it from, but I am going to say, you know, when was the first time that you flipped it from being something that you could do instead of something that you were sneaking and doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to have to say right out of uh, right out of high school. Okay. What right happened of, with that? Uh, you know, it was just to the point to where, uh, man, me and my father, I, I used to be afraid to, I used to be afraid to talk to my pops a lot because it was like, okay, anything I do, you know, my pops, I already know what direction I was going in. So it's like, you know, I was kind of afraid to, you know, open up to him about certain stuff. But as I got older, you get to that, that senior level and it's like, oh, I got to get out the house in a few. Yeah. You know? And my parents wasn't planning on kicking me out the house and nothing, you know, but I've always had that drive of independence, you know. So I'm going crazy thinking about, man, what am I finna do in life? You know, and I was thinking of every way to get out of this house by the time I'm 18 to prove that I'm grown and, you know, I could take care of a family of my own. And uh, that's what I did. But, you know, uh, my pops just told me, man, you got to you got to settle down. You know, you got to you got to go get you a job and, and do this thing right. How old were you when you left the house? I was 17. And how old were you? Well, when actually, you actually, I was 18. I was 18. 18. And I how, had just graduated. And how old were you had your child? I was 18. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought. <laughs> that's in uh, that's 2014. That's really what what made me just straighten all the way up and just go get a job and stay away from everything. Mm -hmm. Like I was actually afraid when I first got my child. Like you know, I was excited, but it was this crazy attachment that I'm sure any real father could understand when you get your first child. And you were there when the baby was being born. Yes, ma'am. And I've okay. actually uh, I've been taking care of another child since he was since before he was a year old so I had experience but it's like when you have your your first one of your own that it's a was difference a, that was a different feeling mm -hmm. and my oldest I forget he's my stepchild at times because I you know you still with the mom yes yes no we have four four kids now four so kids yes, now a family of four so man that's got to be exciting yes yeah, so it's real exciting so you yeah know, uh, we just got uh like I said I was still changing at that time too so uh, we just got engaged. So she uh, held you down to the, through the whole thing. She did, and uh, she's she's a big part of my change because, <laughs> like, she was with me from the time that you know I was still not doing anything, and you know she just having a strong woman on your side and dealing with you at your lowest is that's I think that's the best gift I've had. You know, just having her right there to support me and bring me up when nobody else do. Mm -hmm. So you know. Wow, that's 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 dope, man. To be able to say this, because it helps when you have somebody that to, to hold you down when everything or in your world keeps spinning round and round. Seriously, you know what I'm saying? It, it very much helps to be. People don't know it. It, it structures you in a way to where you want to provide for your family, your kids, and and it's nothing wrong with that, man. It's just being a man, way. being a man. And you know? how old are you now? I'm 27 now. 27. Okay. I love the fact the way how you speak, um, even as a young man, yes, man. knowing. Um, the value of your foundation yes, because a lot of people because you can only go up from here and a lot of people take it for granted especially with the rise and all the attention and all the everything that's going to start coming your way yeah. never forget that you know this is what matters yes and you know like even now you know like i've always been popular you know but um i've always been a great guy too you know? yeah so people people just know my heart in general so it's yeah. like even now, you know, I get the love or whatever. It's cool, but I'm pretty used to, you know, being being that guy that's, you know, always front line or just just in the center of attention. You know, yeah, so. yeah. So, um, you you get into entrepreneurship. Uh, you 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 get your first job. Um, when do you become one that's going to go independent and start your own business? Man, that's the crazy part because. Um, out of high school, you know, if your head is on straight and you plan on getting a job, your dream is just to be the manager or something of that nature. Yeah. You know, you just you just trying to get off, just trying to get off your ass and, and get something. 
you know. So um, my first, my very first job was Texas Roll House. It was in, okay. You know, it was in school, and it was just you like that little thing on your neck. Yeah, man. At that time, it's just like you know, it's, I'm still acting bad or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I finally got out of, out of school, I think my first real job just happened to have been uh, I got a job at Trinity. You know, it was a uh, like an attempt job. Okay. You know, I felt so much like, you know, bring home three hundred dollars a week, but it was like it was something that was man like, you know, yeah. it was like I got a I got a hard hat on, so yeah, you know, it's that feeling. But uh as time went by I got a job at Walmart, a little bit more pay. You know, I'm just sticking to it, just trying to find my groove in something. And uh at that time, I'm thinking from twenty fourteen all the way to twenty seventeen, the only thing that was on my mind was I gotta I gotta get my CDL. Okay. You know, they they make good money, you know, and uh, excuse me, that was a part of you know where I started thinking to myself like I'm gonna own trucks one day, I'm gonna own trucks. That was that was the only thing that was on my mind, and uh, I worked in a job for like three years. I'm talking about five thirty in the morning to seven in the evening, and uh, I lost my touch with that job as well. Still CDL? Though. No, 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 just regular, regular, just regular job. job. Okay. And uh, I lost my touch in those years because it was you got like, burned out. I got burnt out and it was like, man, I'm, you know, this I'm pretty much stuck here. I can't save no money. I'm paying bills. I got two kids now, you know, and it's like I still got a woman to provide for. She's working, but it's like I couldn't save for anything. And it was like I look back now and I'm glad I went through that because you have to take steps in everything, mm-hmm. you know. Uh that was the way I got in the oil field through that job that I was working. I had experience through you know doing that type of work so when i got my oil field job it's just like everything took out for me and you know i stayed in that oil field for about four years three okay. four years and uh it was booming too it was booming. i said wish i knew you i'd have got you to buy some clothes nigga you <laughs> yeah. would have bought them too nigga. we had a lot of people but they, they, they were coming, coming through here boy mm-hmm. they, from odessa them boys were coming oh, yeah. through man man you know a lot of people talk about that and they you know they tell you like oh if you uh if you're not you know hustling or doing sports or rapping you know that's the only dream jobs in the hood, man. If you in uh-uh. Texas, the and oil field Texas. is a dream job. It's a dream man. job. You, you look like a dope boy walking around here right. if you're in the oil field. No cap, man. But the yeah. oil field can mess up a lot of marriages too. Oh my God, oil field. <laughs> oil field was dangerous. You know, I got I got plenty right. calls. I get plenty calls after after work. I might say, hey, I'm gonna go to Bubbles or something. And, Baby trying to check up. What you got going, you know? Yeah. I know you work too much to be trying to step out and get a drink or anything, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but, you know, it's it's all what you make of it. It's all what you make Because it takes up a lot of the time because when you're in the oil field, you work a lot of hours. You're I, away from home for a lot of days. You out there, what, how many how many days? Uh, me, I had a, I had a schedule of 14 and 7. So I would work two weeks and off one. And... The hardest part about the job, if you ask me, if you have a family, Missing that's the hardest family. part, just being right. away. Like, right. working was never a problem. I've been working since I was in high school, you know, so I've never had a problem with working long hours, having a job, or anything like that. But being away from your family, and then you say you off seven days, but, man, you coming and going two of those days. You know, mm-hmm. you on that road, so you getting five days max to be with your loved ones, you know, and... Man, I did the math. You only at home like three months out of a year. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. So let's talk about these. Let's talk about the gear. Let's talk about the shoes. So how did you end up like getting over into retail and or, why or that resale? Business. Resale, right? Okay, so um, all fields went slow. I seen that. I'm gonna touch bases on the clothing first. So um, was that the first thing you started? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now. It wasn't the first uh that wasn't just something i had a passion for okay you know so um when i was in the oil field this is like a couple months before uh COVID started and it's crazy because it's like it's a sign from god almost i look back at it because i'm just an oil field board i've reached that level to where i don't even work that much you know i just show up to work and i just monitor you know i make sure everybody else you know everything goes smooth pretty much and um Man, I just used to be in the tractor, and I'm I'm looking things up, just trying to find another lane to make money outside of the oil field because something just touched me and told me, like, okay, you used to, you used to be mad because you couldn't save. Now you're in a position to where you're making this money, and it's just sitting. You need to invest in something. 
So I, I just had to touch lanes, uh, touch a different lane. And uh, after doing so much research, man, like the only thing that I've ever cared for is just dressing up. You know, I was a kid. When making money as a kid, that's all I wanted to do is go get clothes and get fly. That's what I'm known for, you know, mm -hmm. dressing up. So I feel you. You know, um, that's that's basically the lane I touch. And I just thought about it. And I'm like, man, you know what? What if I start a clothing line? Because I got dope things in my mind that I can put you know, I can bring to life. And uh, basically, I went through with it. And, uh, man, I still remember I announced it. Everybody, it, was, it wasn't it was a big deal when I announced it. Everybody was like, all right, cool. We finna come over with a clothing brand. But uh, when, I, when I dropped my first design, I was still in the oil field. I dropped that design, and I got a call. I dropped it while I was on my off days. So I dropped the shirts off to get done or whatever. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go back to work for two weeks. By the time I get back, man, they're going to be done and we're going to be ready to go. How many designs did you come out with the first time? Uh, Just one. Just I one dropped, design. I dropped one design, but I wanted to be so different than everybody else. So uh, I, I wasn't into coming up with a logo and just dropping it in different colors or doing that. I basically made it to where if I drop a design, that's going to be the design. It's going to be limited. You need to get it now if you want it. And once it's gone, you're not going to get it. So I built that buzz, you know, with my clothes, with the first design. And uh, I don't think everybody realized how detailed I was going to go. So when they got their when they got their clothes, you know, it's it's tags, you know, or the presentation was everything to me. And it's a shirt, just a shirt, or you had, like, a whole fit? Or no, it was just a shirt. It was just, just a shirt. I was just dropping shirts at first. Okay. You know, what was the name of it? It's Black Structure. That's, that's the name of my clothing brand. Mm -hmm. But uh, my first design... You know, it was like a venomous snake, you know, and it was like the like the slash, you know, basically like no snakes allowed, you know, you know, it was it was a it was pretty much like meanings to everything that I dropped, you know, and uh, the way I got that name Black Structure is because you never know what I'm gonna put out. It's not built off one thing, you know. It's like I have plenty of designs that I go with, you know, and it's. The first design is totally different from the next design. It don't even look like the same clothing brand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you look up the definition of structure, it's many things built as one. So, you know, in black, we black, <laughs> you know, that's just us. You know, that's that was my mm -hmm. way of, of putting that together. But, you know, um, like I said, that, that was a sign for me because when I put my first design out, I'm thinking I'm going back to work, and I get a call saying, hey, man, uh, we just got shut down. You know, this COVID is getting bad. You laid off. And I'm like, whoa, you know, like, I just started this. My whole plan was to keep working and invest in my clothes, you know, as I go along. But, you know, I had to jump to plan B real quick. Whatever I got saved, I need to go hard with this and make it a job. Because at first it was just a hobby, just to keep some money flowing in. But... I survived a whole year and a half of just clothes. How much did you end up first investing into the clothes? Uh, in the clothes, I ended up investing. I went cheap the first round. I can't say cheap, but I think I was at like maybe $4,000. I was at like $4,000, and that was mainly just going through samples of shirts, trying to figure out what, you know, what garments I wanted to go with and things of that nature, trying to find someone to print the clothing right. I didn't want any of the heat press or any of that. I wanted to go full fledged, done right. You know, tags on the inside, screen print or direct the garment, something that's gonna last that you can wash, clothes that wasn't gonna shrink. You know, I wanted it packaged right, everything. You know, I had stickers, you know, with my logo. I just went the, you know, the whole nine the first go round to show people that I was serious. And about this was it. you was it direct to consumer or did you have a place where they were coming to buy it or was it I was just direct Direct to consumer. Direct. I'm I'm shipping out, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. man, I, I went through so much and uh my fiance took so many pictures of me in that stage and I look back, I'm so glad she did that, you know. It, she got pictures of me in the living room with hundreds of packages being shipped out, you know, and things of that nature. So, Are you, you know, still car currently carrying that brand? I'm still yeah. currently carrying mm -hmm. that brand. Okay. So when you, when you, okay, now. Hold on. I want to go back. I wanna, how many shirts did you order on your first time around? So that that's something crazy as well. 
I had this thought in my head was just telling me like you're not gonna sell that much. So basically, I told everybody, "Hey man, I'm gonna you know I'm dropping this shirt. It's limited. I never told anybody my limit, but my limit was was 30 shirts, and um, I was getting so many orders, and I was making people go ahead and pay me right then. That way, I wouldn't waste anything. And it's like I was getting so many cash apps. It was like, oh my god, like. By the time I looked up and started counting, I was at 45. And I'm like, okay, ain't no way in hell I'm going to be able to just do 30 shirts because they actually dealing with this shirt. I got 100 shirts right now, you know, so I need to try to go as much as I can go, you know. And um, by the time I ended, I was at about 76 shirts. And basically what I did, I got all those made, and all of those were spoken for. I didn't have any left over, so I basically just cut it off and was like, hey, I'm sold out. You know, I could have kept going an extra 25, but I was like, you got to stick with your plan. You already done overdid it. You were supposed to do 30 shirts, and now you got 70 some shirts. So it's like, slow down. So I had to stick to that and just boom, you know. But even after I sold that shirt, people were still reaching out like, hey, man, can I get it? And once, I think that's what drove it so crazy because once I had to tell people like, nah, they gone. You know, people like, Oh, shit, it ain't that accessible, <laughs> you know, like, I got to get this. So over the period of time of that happening, I was getting to the point to where I'm checking my cash app, and I'm getting cash apps from people like, oh, this for the next design. Just lock me in. I don't care what it is, you know, mm. and, and, and I built that foundation. And, you know, over the period of time, I earned some serious money with clothes alone, and I just converted it into the shoes and got me a store. And it's been up ever since. And I had, you know, it was a bumpy road at first, but, you know, everything worked out perfect. But when you were doing um, the shirts and you went over into the shoes, why not do um, brand new shoes? Why go into the resale of shoes? So <laughs> I've always wanted to do a shoe of my own, you know. And uh, I'm not sure if y'all familiar. There's a guy right now. He's blowing up. Air Kai, uh, Cool Kai. And, uh Erica, cool guy. It's kind of like the, where is he out of? He's he's from New Jersey. Okay, so um he has a silhouette of the Jordan One, you know, and uh he's big in the game right now, you know. So I've always wanted to do something is, like that. Is he a brother? Is, Bro he, is he a black guy? Yeah, he's black. He's black. Light skinned. Kind of light skinned. Yeah, I yeah. know. I know. So, he, he was kinda, on the Breakfast Club once, I believe. I'm not sure if he had done a Breakfast Club yet. Yeah, he how been. long he been around a while? He been around for about a year and a half now. He, uh, he started, no, no, he it wasn't yeah. This long. guy, this guy just blew up not too long. Look him ago. up. What's his name again? Air Kai. Spell it. Uh, matter of <laughs> fact, it's Cool Kai. K O O L K I Y. Cool Kai. K I Y. That's different. K I Y. But you know, I wanted to do something like that, but C it's hard. C O O L. No K O O L. No K O O L. Mm -hmm. What else? K I Y. K K I Y. I got him right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a pretty popular guy, you know. But um, to you said get in, you wanted to do something like that. I wanted to do something like that, but you have to really, you know, you got to really do some background, and you got to go through a lot to get to that level. So basically, I've always been a sneakerhead. So that was my my father's way of keeping me out of a lot of trouble when I was in school. Mm -hmm. If I keep my grades up, which I've always, I graduated like top twenty five of my class. So the grades have never been a problem. It was always, you know, me getting into stuff outside of school. But Pops would always buy me any shoe that I wanted as long as I stayed out of trouble. Mm -hmm. So I've always had lots of shoes. I've been a sneakerhead for the longest. And uh, basically, you know, they, they created a whole market for the shoes. And, you know, that was just a way, that was just a lane that I jumped in because I'm like, okay, I'm already a sneakerhead. I know a lot about this. You know, and uh, this would keep the, I guess, um, the eyes and attention around me, you know. And uh, I went with that plan, and it's also my best friend as my partner. So when I got the store, that's when me and my best friend linked up. That's and that came white together. guy on the picture on the on your Instagram. He's that's Mexican. Mexican. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, he good. He but, Mexican. But um, okay, because when I'm thinking about resale, I'm like, okay, this is a cool way. To to even get because you say you've been a sneakerhead forever you have shoes yes, that's yeah. well kept that you didn't have you couldn't do nothing with it so i got shoes from high school right so, <laughs> and, and i'm sure they're well kept uh -huh. so that would be a good way of putting some of those in the in the shop and reselling whatever but where do you get 
how do you get people to bring in shoes or where or you go buy shoes from people oh, how does so, that work it's is mean when i first got in i was lost myself although i'm a sneakerhead mm -hmm. i was lost because it's like okay and how long you been doing it now reselling i've been reselling for a year now okay because it's a big thing now it's a big it's thing everywhere and i've uptown everywhere i've always been in the buy sell trade over mm -hmm. the years but uh never to where i could have my own spot and just say hey i got the shoes y'all come to me so with that when when i first started out the money that i had saved it was wasted you know buying fixtures just stuff that i didn't need you know and uh me and my partner came together we put some money together we got the building I know we spent every bit of six, seven thousand on fixtures, and we threw them away in, in months, like two Why or three months. Why didn't you sell them back? We sold a couple of them, but a lot of them was was tore up. We got them okay. from a Coles that was shutting down, mm. just stuff that we didn't need, and we got rid of it. But um, it was a growing pain. It's, it's, it's a growing phase, you, you know. And we got it back over the period of time, which is why mm. I try not to even, you know, act well, like it was a regret, you know. So it was just a stepping stone for us, and um. Man, I started out with most of my personal shoes. That's what I would think. Yeah, we, I had nothing but eight and a halves in the store for like two weeks. And, you know, you got people coming by trying to support, and they like, bro, you know, I wear 11, I wear 12, you know. So that was the hardest part, but just kept on going with it. And I had a lot of clothes to choose from as well. So people will come by. If they, didn't, if they couldn't get any shoes, they'll just say, hey, man, you know, I'm going to show my support. I'm going to buy a shirt or something like that. Right. And over the period of time, support turned into okay yeah this is a full store now you know and i got a picture of when we first opened you looking at it and it's like okay they ain't got that many shoes and then you know three four months down the line i got a wall with over 150 shoes on it and everybody like god he really turned this you know he really turned nothing where did into you something get all right those shoes from and how did you shoe source? conventions oh you, you have a shoe convention for resale shoes shoe conventions you got um people will there's local resellers all around so the local resellers that's who we try to target you know the local resellers and they these are not these. brand brand new shoes they're, they're oh yes they brand new shoes oh okay so yeah, why do why do, why is it no, called well i think it's and, and, because and, I, let me, that's let the concept me, no but you got to think about it it's when a shoe comes out that shoe's only out for so, such a little yeah, amount of time and then after that they can't get it no more we got shoes in here right now yeah, so that's right. steadily going up on stock what's that thing stock x, stock stock x. x and uh all those different places oh, like, i know those shoes i gave a dude some shoes that were used out of here and he said they were four hundred dollars yeah so i had gotten them from though. some i hadn't gotten them from uh when we bought those shoes from that guy that had the truck and he brought it over and when I gave it to him, I think I charged him about eighty bucks for it. He said, Man, them shoes worth four hundred dollars. I understand, but then when I think about resale, I'm thinking about more like almost like a thrift type of thing where no. they're, you know, used and nah. you're selling them back. Yeah, but um the okay, so basically like shoes have gotten harder over the years. These are two popular brands. Uh, Yeezys, of course, and Retro me, Ones, and Jordans. The, yeah, the, these here, these are Yeezys. Yeah, so the Yeezys is hard to get. Very hard, very hard. You what know? these run for? You Kanye charging about a thousand dollars. You know what's crazy, crazy, man? They went down a little bit. Didn't yeah, it? what's crazy is this shoe was released, I believe, like twenty seventeen, I think, or no, it was probably before then. This shoe was worth like a thousand. So when they re release yeah. the old pair, will still be up, but the new pair. They'll, you know, they'll come down in price. Yeah. But if it's a highly anticipated shoe, that shoe is still going to have, you know, a little bit of profit on it. So, you know, this shoe right here, you probably going to, the cheapest you'll get them is probably 400, in a, 400 in a resale store. In a resale. You know, and that's because of the convenience. You go on StockX or GOAT, you might get them $50 cheaper, but you still finna have to wait for them to get shipped yeah, out shipped to you, out get to authenticated you. and, you know, things of that nature. So... Basically, uh, what they have now is things called flex accounts and stuff like that. So these new local resellers, they basically have these accounts and stuff, and they clean up nice. You know, they, they're they the reason that a lot of people hate us. Let me just throw that out there. But, Why? You know, because they feel like we're the ones that's buying all the shoes from the stores and they can't get them. Yeah. You know, but it's really not us. There's it's This is just a food chain, you know. So if you got those accounts or you, you paying for those bots online – you cleaning up nice where you getting 30 to 50 pair of these shoes at retail. So where I come in at, you just put a couple of dollars on a couple of these shoes. If I buy them in bulk, if I get 20 or more from you, put $50 on them or something like that. And you're going to see your profit right then. 
Then what I do is I take them, I put them in my store, and I may put fifty to seventy dollars on them, and I get my profit right then. You get what mm. I'm saying? How much these here going for? Those are up in price right now. They might be around like four fifty. If I had them in my store, I'd have to do five hundred just because that's a that's a dope shoe. Mm-hmm. Shutter backboard. You can't 3. find 0. them hardly anywhere. No, you're not gonna find those anywhere. Not in stores or anything like that. Uh, resale stores, you can still find them because they came out like maybe like. Two years ago, maybe a year and, and a half. And keep your finger crossed that you can find your size. There you go. That's that's the hard part about my store. Right. Okay, so when new releases come out, we might have a full-size run from a size 3 all the way up to a size 13. So you get brand-new shoe releases? Yes, ma'am. You okay. get brand-new shoe releases. So, like, we might have a full-size run, but over the period of time, you might come in my store and looking for a shoe, and you see the exact shoe that you want. Now, the hard part is, is it your size? You know, so over the period of time, things get mixed up, and I might only have one of these shoes. It could be a 10 and a half, but you wear a size 9. You know, so it's like, okay, well, back to square one. Let me find something that I like. So the question that we get uh, a lot when people walk in the store is, hey, what do you have in this size? Because they already know. I know everything is not going to be in my size. So I just want you to go ahead and show me everything that's in my size. That way I won't even get my hopes up if I look at something, mm -hmm. you know. So. What's the most expensive shoe that you've sold? The most expensive shoe that I've sold. I've sold some expensive shoes. What's the most? I think around like maybe a Travis Scott one, a low, for like 1600 Yeah, yeah. Like 1600 that, that, That's That's a good place. Um what, because um, you, you you see this all the time. I mean, it's an, one sh they had this store that all the rappers go to and spend money with this guy. I think he was in, was he in L.A.? Probably Cool Kicks. Yeah, that's who it Probably was. Probably Cool yeah, Kicks. Yeah. We have one here in Dallas, uh, PCH. Yeah. You know, and the PCH is big. Like, they, yeah. and I'm I'm very cool with those guys. I've been cool with them for years. I've shot with them and everything so mm. so when you what what is the what is the what is the end game for you in the shoe game what what do you want what would you what would you want to see yourself within the next three years maybe five i definitely want to get to a bigger city i love the fact that i'm in tyler because i'm the only one in tyler me and me and my partner of course um tyler is that is that city of east texas you know uh that's where the colleges are medical fields and all of that so you you have a lot of you know you have a lot of money coming through tyler but you wouldn't close that so you would just I open would another never, i would never right, close you the store would open, in tyler. right you just open another what's the store? name of the store it's level up sneakers and more level up sneakers and more level up sneakers and more, and more. so and you right in that uh you in the tyler mall in broadway square mall broadway square because is it two of them i thought it was just one it's uh the malls. Yeah. Well, actually, Tyler Broadway mall. Square Mall, they have that Tyler Mall, and they have an outlet. Like, it's a new outside outlet mall. Okay. It's yeah, down I heard the that's street. The hot, I just heard that it just have a new mall, and it's hot. It's They have the Nike factory and stuff like yeah. that. They're the Nike store. The how, Nike did, how does that affect your business? Not really? It do, uh, Man, it really don't affect me. Actually, um, a lot of people ask that. You know, they like, how do you maintain with uh being around finish line or foot locker right well that's two different lanes they're retail and i'm resale that's what i was i was wondering earlier when you said you got you get new shoes i'm yes, like so what makes you different from any of those stores? well basically basically um the difference is the retail stores they have contracts with nike you know adidas things of that nature we don't have any contracts we got to go out and get ours so you got to put in that footwork to you know be doing the things that I'm doing. And so, how do you make sure that what you're getting is authenticated shoes and you, not fake shoes? You got to know what you're looking at because the the uh, replicas these days, I'm telling you, when I tell you they spot on, it's not like 2007 and 2008. You almost got to have a, a shoe that Didn't you tell know you for that a fact. Mm -hmm. You got to pretty much have a shoe that you know for a fact is legit. And have it next to that. Tell us fake. the secret. Tell us the secret. How do you? How how can you know? Can you look at the shoe? Can you? Is there something inside of the shoe that you can look at? How can you, you know? Sometimes you just have to have that eye for it. We've been dealing with it so long. So, and I'm not saying that we just experts. So you can be we, fooled. Yeah, like we can be fooled. <laughs> but you know, the only thing with that is where we're all the way legit is because mostly we're always going to have a, at least one retail pair. So. 
if you have somebody coming in and uh, they don't have proof of purchase, and even if you do have proof of purchase, I'm still going to check anyway, you know, unless you're just all the way verified with me. If you're a new customer coming in and you say, hey, man, I just got this shoe, I still got the receipt, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, do a little bit of comparison. All right, cool. Look at your receipt. Make sure it's legit. All right, cool. We're good. But you have people that will come in and they'll have a shoe that look all the way legit. If you don't check it, I guarantee you it's going to pass you up that quick. Like I've I've gotten a fake shoe where I've had to basically do my, you know, do my homework and everything lines out except for one thing. It could be the stitching and at the bottom of the shoe, the colors or anything the shape could be off, anything. It like they're they're getting to the point to where they only got one flaw on the fake. And that's scary because that's too close to to real. But being in the clothing business, we know that it's not always a case that it's fake yeah. because you have defected items that came straight from the company. That's what normally goes to these outlets. Those are so, B grades, yes. Right. So Correct. it's not that they're fake. It's just that um, so how do you do you accept those? Like yes, the ones, those I, I have I have accepted B grades. So like, uh, I don't know if you guys know, it's like a Legend Low Eleven. Mm-hmm. A lot of those they had like a fade on them, and a lot of them came from the Nike outlet. Mm-hmm. So the way we do that is you have to have proof of purchase on those. We gotta know exactly where you got them from, and all of that. And they even come in different boxes at times. Right. So you know, I, we have accepted B grades, and uh, another one is the Carmine Six. A lot of people were turning those down on the release date because the red in the suede was bleeding into the sole, and it's a white sole on it, so it made the white sole turn into pink. So a lot of people was turning those down, and they sent a lot of those to Nike outlets. Mm -hmm. Me, personally, that was a good part of history for that shoe to release and that do that, so... I I got me two on tuck, you know, just put to the side because that's history. Yeah. You know, that yeah. was something big mm-hmm. that happened. But a lot of people didn't look at it like that because a lot of people don't have the knowledge on certain stuff. So they just kind of was like, no, nah, I'm not paying for that. Yeah, because certain you shoes know. you can put up and, you know, the value is going to increase. Definitely. Any OGs, like any type of original Jordan with that red, black and white colorway or that Carolina colorway. If it's that Nike Air on the back, it, it, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of shoes that come out that you definitely want to just, just have. Get your two hundred dollars. Don't even wear it. Don't just, even wear it. Just <laughs> put it to the back of the closet, man. If you can hit for retail, man, put them to the back of the closet, man. I'm telling you. And it's just you know some of the shoes that I felt like I wasn't even collecting shoes back in the day for money. It was just my love for shoes. I would be scared to wear my shoes, and uh, they were. They worth crazy amounts these days. And, no, you know. I, I get it, man. I, I think that you guys, that what you've come up with is uh, is dope, man. So, um, what uh, what shoe is it that you would love to have had that you know would go for? Because there are some get up in the thousands and thousands, the high thousands. What what's the, I know you've seen them because I've seen them. Yeah. What's the one that you would like? Dang, I wish I had that here in the store. I'd box it in glass and it'd be here, buddy. Man, a Nike Air Mag. From uh, the shoe from Back to the Future. Yeah, mm. yeah. You know, if I could, would you shoe, ever sell it, or you just would keep I it? I wouldn't. I wouldn't sell it. Um, that shoe is worth like maybe fifty grand, thirty to fifty grand. Is when the shoe get that high, you make your own market on it. So, you know that that shoe is. Is that sold. the most expensive shoes that you know about, or is um, there something that's higher than that that you know of? Oh. Uh, I'm thinking uh, maybe the Wahlberg fours. I think they like three hundred thousand or somewhere in there. It's like crazy. It's some shoes that's up in price, like literally that I probably would never, never would run into. You I never know. Somebody might have it and don't know what they have. Well, this guy, man, like <laughs> this guy, he, um, I met him in Vegas at at Magic, and uh, he always do that. He got like, I think he got like three million uh, in shoes in a room, and uh, he's he he insures it. Was yeah. it was it two J's? Two J. He he Arabian type looking dude, like kind of Hispanic like. Yeah, gray hair and yeah, it's probably two J's. Me he and him be biggest. together. I don't even know him, but I, everybody be like, man, he's somebody. I be just we he, just be hanging out. He's definitely down to earth. You know, uh, every time me and two J's run into each other, you know, we. What did he speak, used to be big a, and he lost weight? I don't know if two J used to be big or not, but I I do know he used to be homeless. He used to be two homeless. J's. Let me look him up. I yeah, two J's. Two J's used to be homeless. How do you spell his name on here? Uh, T W O, 
uh, JS. Or it might be J A Y S. Let me see. Two J's kicks. That's him. Yeah, no, that ain't him. That's not him. Yeah, that that guy used to be that guy used to be homeless and he's probably the richest reseller in the world. I know he has the biggest resale store in the world. It's inside of Caesar's Palace right now in, in mm. Las Vegas. And the man got a five mile. How long he's had it there? Because I know. Oh, uh, he just either. got there. I was about to there. say. He got it, and he's had plenty of stores. Yeah, over but just, the I'm talking of time. just in there. Yeah, just in there. It, yeah. it's it probably hasn't even been a I year. I hadn't seen that one. It probably hasn't been a year since he's been in there. But his no, wall we didn't is go like, shopping last time. Yeah, Where is he at in Caesar's Palace? Caesar's Palace. Caesar's Palace. We have to stop by there in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and look. But yeah. um, so okay, so if I have a pair of shoe that I've, um, what are the requirements if I wanted to come and sell my shoe to you? What are the requirements? This the original tag. Basically, does it um, have to be like never been worn? Yes. For me, some mm-hmm. stores sell used shoes because there's a great market for used shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people get shoes for super cheap because uh, the way the game works now, some people will buy a shoe, wear it once, take good care of it, and just say, hey, man, I just want some of my money back. So those are good deals that people get, and they re- they clean them up real good right? and get, you know, they make their profit quicker that way. I don't do that. I'd rather deal with dead stock shoes, brand new. So, um, So you don't buy shoes from individuals? Yes, ma'am, I do, but okay. they have to be brand new. Brand new. So, you know, like, there's a lot of people who come by. Like, yeah, because if they clean it up real good, how you going to know if oh, it's you'll been know worn if they one brand, time? You'll know. You'll know. <laughs> you'll know. So, and I'm not going to act like none has been slip, slipped in, <laughs> homie. But <laughs> some people have slipped shoes on me, like, okay, well, you know, I, they never been worn, and I might be like, okay, check the shoe out, and then I catch later, like, oh, man, there's some lint on the inside of something that they missed. They could have tried it on, because if that you too, try on a shoe, you're going to still have, that's what I'm telling people, try I'm like, if you try on a shoe in a store, and, of course, the, the store have dust on the floor, the bottom of it going to have a little <laughs> bit of dirt on it. It's not like he wore it outside. There's it's been still- times. There's been times where people will come to me and they say, "Hey, I'm uh, this just tried on. Right. If it's immaculate, I will still, you know, okay. I'll, I'll work with it and buy it. But um, as so far say as- the shoe is worth two hundred dollars, mm-hmm. um, or they purchased it for two hundred dollars. What's normal? I know because people normally look on their computers and tell you how much, mm-hmm. but how much would you normally buy that shoe from them for? So if it's at two hundred dollars, I'm probably not gonna buy it anyway. Because uh, it has to have some type of resale, even if it jumps up to like thirty dollars. You get what I'm saying? So, basically, if you bring a shoe to me that just came out and it's not a highly anticipated shoe, that shoe is probably not going to be high at all. You pay two hundred five for it, it'll probably be at like two twenty or two thirty on Goat or StockX. Well, in that case, I can't give you any type of resale. I can give you your money back because at that point, that's what they call a brick. Basically, it missed. You know, it's, it's going to be a hit or miss. If it's a if it's a hit, I can afford to put a couple dollars on top of it to make some money off of it. But if not, you can get your money back at retail, and I'll just put it out there, throw fifty dollars on it, and go from there. So mm-hmm. yeah, well, I, I I'll be honest with you. You're uh, you, you're doing your thing, and I, I definitely think that's that's worth noting, man. Yeah, you know what man. I mean? I appreciate it, man. Yeah, you got to keep that going. Yeah. Going back into it, man. Just um um. Definitely, man. Uh, how could a, a person get a hold of you if they was trying to learn the game? And you, you know, do you ever give back in that way? Will you educate man, a young man on something like that? I always do. And the crazy thing is, um, <laughs> when I first got in, I did months of research and everything like that. But uh, it's like for our culture, is the game is to be sold, not told. Uh, it's cool on. On certain levels, but I try not to be that person, man. You know, it's, it's I feel like it's enough money out here for everybody. And uh, any knowledge that I can help somebody with, I'd be glad to because I didn't have nobody to do that for me. You know, well, the more you give, the more you receive. Do you believe that God is able to keep you? You whatever God has for you is coming to you anyway. That's a fact. That's a fact. So I come I out. Of, I come out of so much, and and I don't even talk about it. It's like it, it's gotten so crazy because. Other people mention it now, you know. Other people speak on how much I've done since. And these were times even when I was broke, you know, didn't have nothing to Mm -hmm. give at all. I was giving my last, you know. And I just always feel like, you know, and one of my friends always, you know, (laughs) we bump ears all the time because, man, I could see somebody on the corner and just hand them a $10 bill and he'd be like, man, stop doing that, bro. Like, they got the same 24 hours, but, you know, 
I can understand where he coming from, but at the same time, I, I just be wanting to help as much as I can. Man, that's dope, man. It, Which is good, which is good, because I remember when we started, and color has nothing to do with it, because I remember going to the Trade Center, and you see people of all different races, and you'll talk to them and ask them different things about business, and I remember I got the same response for some, from some white and some black folks that they wouldn't really try to help you at all, yeah. but then some did. You know what I mean? So, and... When you go to a place like that, it's not like your story is going to be right around the corner. They don't even know that. Exactly. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's people from everywhere, but they just refuse to get help you. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of hard getting help these days. Everybody's a more of a, you know, every man for himself type, mm-hmm. type of instinct that we got now. It's crazy. Well, we de- definitely appreciate you for coming on the show, man. man uh, how can people get a hold of you if they uh trying to reach out to you? Um, uh, my personal Instagram is going to be uh, Big Lucci, B-I-G-L-U-C-C-I, two underscores. Or you can follow my business page at Level Up ETX. That's L-E-V-E-L-U-P-E-T-X. Man, hey, when you get them uh, real, real expensive shoes, bring them by here. Let me go on and show these folks we got them. Man, I got you. I got you. Already, man. man. Thank you, Big Lucci, for coming on the show, man. I appreciate y'all. Man, we love you, brother, and we appreciate you, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101.